Alrighty. They <laughs> shall <laughs> <laughs> like that like button. <laughs> Ooh. Live. Oh, I'm so glad that me. face is recorded, by the way. <laughs> I'm so glad that that has been forever captured on the internet. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, just a quick heads up before we actually start our our regularly scheduled programming. We're trying something new. Uh, we're actually going to be having live Q&A. If you're watching on YouTube, you should see an option to, uh, I think it says, what, jump into the conversation? Yeah, if you're, if you're on YouTube on a desktop, you should see a little link in the bottom of your video feed that says um, to click in to join the Q&A and you'll be able to actually leave a question throughout the episode that we can um, ask Michelle later. Michelle yep. is a painter and an art gallery manager, so if you have any questions on those topics, fire away. Or just any questions in general. Whatever you got, we're, uh, we're here to answer. So that's an exciting addition, and uh, I think if, if there's nothing else, why don't we jump in? You guys ready? Yep. Bring it. All righty, so I am digital illustrator Mike Meth. I'm model and body painter Caitlin St. Angelo. I'm web designer and videographer Kevin Hoffman. I'm painter and gallery manager Michelle Lamb, and this is Artistic Awareness. Welcome to episode six of the Artistic Awareness podcast, a bi-weekly discussion of the unspoken issues facing artists today. Our guest for this episode is Michelle Lamb, painter and gallery manager based out of Booton, New Jersey. Since graduating from the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan, Michelle has worked as an oil and acrylic painter in addition to managing She Gallery, an abstract art gallery located in Bhutan. Our topic for this episode is Bad Art Days, and we're going to follow that discussion with a Q&A about Michelle's work as an art gallery manager. Mike, why don't you kick things off? All righty, welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, we actually have a really, really interesting topic tonight, the, uh, the concept of Bad Art Days, which I know is something that we are all entirely too familiar with. Uh, I want to <laughs> I want to formally welcome you, Michelle. Uh, thank you for being here. And thank what I, I guess I want to get from you is, who are you? Is there anything we missed on? And uh, you know, what has you be here tonight with us? Um, who am I? Uh, who I'm are Michelle. you? <laughs> um, I'm an artist. I've been making art my whole life, pretty much. Um, went to the School of Visual Arts, live in Bhutan now. When did you start? She's totally <laughs> underselling herself. She's, <laughs> she's kind of a big deal. And she's not going to tell you oh, she's amazing. God, kind of. <laughs> um, I generally paint portraits. Um, and uh, I was asked if I had any links to share, and I don't because I actually get most of my work through word of mouth right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. When did you start? That's the cool way to do it. Traditional yeah. painting, specifically, is that, What's that? was traditional. Uh, we we tend to call people who paint with real paint traditional painters. Yeah, we're so <laughs> heavily into the digital world, uh, Mike and I. But uh, is that something you started with, or is that something you grew into after like sketching or illustration, or was painting um, your first medium? I mean, I my mom's an artist, so we always had. Uh, acrylic and oil and pastels and every kind of art medium imaginable mm -hmm. in my house. So mm -hmm. it was just a playground for creating nice. things. <laughs> so I've always been using all of it. Very cool. Yeah. That sounds like an okay childhood to have. <laughs> also lots of animals too. So that was fun. <laughs> that explains a lot about you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Just to so, kind of frame up uh, the rest of the episode and the answers you'll be giving based on your experience, can you tell everyone a little bit about what the work of an art gallery manager entails? Yeah, um, an art gallery manager um, has a lot of <laughs> roles, especially in a small gallery. Um, mm -hmm. My job was pretty much everything, run the whole place. So it went from you know marketing to direct sales to curating the shows, to choosing the art, to artist relationships, client relationships, um, going to people's houses and you know giving them advice on which painting to hang. Uh, oh, interesting. Uh, uh, lots of emailing, pretty much <laughs> just a whole whole days of emailing, <laughs> um, wow. emailing artists, emailing clients. Is it um, usually the case that you? actively seek out the art or you have like an open door policy that people can submit freely? That's that an work? interesting question actually. Different galleries work different ways. Um, in our gallery it mostly worked through networking so mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, we'd find an artist through another artist a lot of the time, or through a designer. Um, that just sort of happened to be the way it, way it went. Okay. Uh, though we were open to uh, artist submissions, they just never mm. really worked out. <laughs> All right, All right. Uh, Kate, why don't you uh, let's let's jump into the topic for the episode. Do you want to start off by just giving us some background on what what is a bad art day? Absolutely, we can jump into that. Um, so we're going to start our discussion basically with what is a bad art day, and um, bad art days definitely occur to everyone a little bit differently. And I want to specify that when we're talking about bad art days, I don't just mean you know when you're kind of like your skill sets off, you know your line work's not good, you're just you're not making. I don't know, you're just not getting it on paper, your paintings just aren't turning out. It's more than that. A bad art day, actually Mike has said this before, he goes, well, I'm having a bad art day, I'm having a bad day, period. And that's yeah. what we're getting at, is when that bad art day ceases to just keep itself to your art, and it just it really becomes a bad day. Um, so that's when, when we're talking about having a bad art day, that's what we're talking about, that kind of like all-encompassing, enveloping, and it, it is, so we're talking and about we're talking about when a bad bad art creeps into the rest of your life, mm -hmm. but at the same time distinguishing that it's not just a bad day; it really is triggered by right. your work. So there's two distinctions there, I think that um, and that's, kind of set the foundation for this discussion. Yeah. That's actually it, really well put. Yeah. Another thing that we hit on, I think, in the the first episode, the awareness episode, or maybe it was I don't remember which was, but the we were really talking separation between creation yeah. and creator. Right. That there. That's one of the, the biggest things we try and hit on is that as artists, there's this tendency to, there's like a direct link that we have between ourselves as artists and whatever it is that we're creating. So if there is something, like if somebody says, oh, you know, your piece of art is garbage or it's bad or whatever. They value their, right. your art, they're like yeah. devaluing you personally. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Because we identify, we essentially, we define ourselves by our work. And so I think that's that's what brings upon these bad art days is that you know if something's going wrong with the art, whatever that means, it, we wear that like a, a personal just whatever. Um, so let's so, talk about what yeah. what they look like for each of us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So our roundtable question is, what does a bad art day look like for you? And I'll start because I'm totally having one. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and they definitely occur in slightly different ways depending uh, you know, on what's going on. Um, it's usually some sort of cascading effect where one thing, I'm upset by one thing, so then the second thing is even bigger, so then the third thing is just like this rolling series of unfortunate events mm -hmm. where it's like, like F this, I'm gonna lay down. I don't want. I'm not getting up. I'm not getting up. I'm gonna lay right here and just be cranky and miserable, and I'm probably gonna cry, and I'm not gonna make any art, and forget this, and I'm just gonna give up and be a secretary. That's you guys usually. think she's joking? She's totally. Yeah. Joking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that's that's pretty much how they occur to me, and uh, so they probably look very quiet because I just kind of don't want to get up. I just kind of want to sit. I don't really want to be bothered. I don't want to answer the phone. Mm -hmm. Um, I definitely don't want to make any more bad art. Um, and it usually eventually rolls into me, like I said, like questioning, you know, if I'm this upset, do I really want to be an artist as right. a profession? Is this really what I'm like cut out to do? Should I be doing something that spares my health and sanity? And maybe just do, I'll just do art on the side, you know? Um, and it's, it's a weird cycle of events, and uh, I definitely get caught up in it from time to time. So that's that's for me, uh, Michelle. How do they? i you've told me a little bit. <laughs> how do bad art days look for you? Um, I mean, it depends. Sometimes it's you know, I wake up and I think it it's it. I don't have that feeling where I I need to create. Like that's the best feeling when you're like, oh god, I need to create, and you just sit on the floor and you're like feverishly working away. Um, but when like you don't have that and you have to manage yourself, you're like, all right. Deadline's coming up, got to paint, and you get out of bed and just don't feel like it. But you don't have any, like, any boss telling you, like, come on, do it, blah, like, I don't know. Yeah. You don't have coworkers, like, to, to vent to. You just mm -hmm. got to deal you with it yourself. just take it all personally, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the, the hardest thing, I think. Um, and sometimes I'll, I'll, on a bad art day, I'll sit at the computer, you know, with my coffee, and I'm like, I'll just... 
browse Reddit for like an hour. <laughs> it, it'll be fine. And then five hours go by and we're like, oh, God, now I don't have time to paint. Now I gotta go do this other thing. So do you yeah. think they're more likely for you when you're doing a commission work that's due tomorrow or when it's just trying to get better on your own? When are they more likely, do you think? Um, that depends, too. I mean... Is it more I about have, the deadline? Because I, I find that if a deadline is super close, that kind of supersedes my bad art days. And right. Kicks me yeah. Into gear. I just fin well, it. it I, have to, I have examples actually of that just happened to me. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm going to be in this show coming up for like um, the. It's like a wildlife art show thing, um, and okay. the deadline was today, and I just finished the <laughs> painting a few days ago, and I was really, I was like, oh my god, I gotta get this done, the deadline's coming up. Then I have another painting that's a commission that I've been sitting on for like a year, which is okay, it's huge, and the people don't mind really, but um, still, it's just like this thing that is like yeah. freaking the, me out. The uh, ambiguous deadline is always... I think that yeah. ambiguous yeah. deadline is what's <laughs> getting me, because I have all these uh -huh. other now deadlines, I have another thing that I have to do, another project, that's actually now I have two projects and I don't know. I agreed to do something I shouldn't have agreed to do. <laughs> two <laughs> yeah. paintings in one month, but you'll get it done. I have yeah. all the faith in the world. So Caitlin says so. Art days. Yes, I said so. Um, when you have your bad art days, do you get that kind of like unmotivated, sluggish, like screw the world? I'm just gonna play video games and ignore my yes. feelings, kind of thing. Because yeah. that's totally what I do. I mean that. <laughs> That's when it's, that happens more with the ambiguous deadlines and mm -hmm. when it's my own work for myself. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I, it's the self-management and, and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll have a bad day and it'll turn into a bad week, you know, mm -hmm. and then it'll turn into a bad month. Um, but I try and try and remind myself that, you know, like, it's, I've been doing art for years, and I keep doing it, so it's probably not the end. <laughs> Even yeah, though it probably well, feels like, like, this is the end. I'm never right. making art again. I'm stuck in this bad day. For me, it's not only the end, it's the end of the world. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, it's I mean, the it's end of me world. and the world. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. we'll talk about how to stop that snowball. Right, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, Mike, how are yeah. your bad art days? Oh jeez, I I feel like just in talking about it, I'm gonna have to live this experience. I don't even. <laughs> I know I've got a project it's, sitting right over there. Right, right. Like, oh no. It's just, I mean, there there are a couple ways that they usually come about for me. Uh, one of the one of the ones that I particularly hate is I'll be working on something and I'm actually feeling really good about it, and I'll I'll plug like hours and hours and hours into it, and then all of a sudden for whatever reason I'm like, this is garbage. Oh yes. <laughs> Oh my, what was I thinking? <laughs> what kind of it? Yeah. Who could think that this was not garbage? <laughs> At what point does that happen, though? I have no idea. It's, 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 it's honestly, really I've arbitrary. watched Mike work, and it seems to be so arbitrary that he's like, this is going good. Check out what I'm doing. This is like, yeah. look at what I'm doing. This is going, wow, this is going great. This is garbage. This is garbage. <laughs> How could anyone think yep. that this is good? How could I have thought this is good? How can you? How dare you think this is good? This is awful. Right. And, yeah. Just that is like, so familiar, so terribly familiar. Right, and you know the way that it actually shows up, but like literally on Facebook, if if you're watching closely, when I'm posting things, a lot of times you can see that I will post something, and if you try and make a comment five minutes later, <laughs> there's, nothing there, there's nothing there to comment on. <laughs> For the thing you post that's done, and then it shows mm -hmm. up as like three more iterations. Okay, no, but really it's done, and then another couple hours later. Seriously, guys. I was just talking. Totes my done. mom's also an artist, and I was just talking to her. She's been bugging me about a deadline for something, mm. and um, uh, I'm like, Mom, I repainted this thing like three times mm. already. <laughs> and it's it's that's like this is one of the, this is one of the really big things that uh. I need to step away from like... the screen for two seconds. I okay, not a problem. Right. Keep we'll going. carry the show here. So yeah, the the whole notion of the bad art day that's that was one of the main things that made me say something needs to be done. That was one of the biggest inspirations for artistic awareness. Uh, like the, the idea that I, I'm sitting and I'm putting all these hours of work. The thing is essentially done. You know, for anybody 
mm. with any type of common sense, the thing is done. Yeah. I mean, I'm sitting there and I'm obsessing over the like I'm literally making myself physically sick, sick to my stomach, and uh, it's just it's awful and it's not a way to live. And no. I think that you know the fact that we're all dealing with these things. This is why you know this is why we created this program to have these discussions. Right. Well, when I get, I'm gonna unmute Michelle here. <laughs> Michelle, you have to unmute yourself. She's waving. She's waving to the camera. There's a waving icon the on the top where you can turn yourself back on. I think I'm on. Am I You're on? You're back. Welcome back. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, let's wrap wrap this up with my a web designer's bad art day. Mm -hmm. um, for me, uh, it's about a lack of progress. I mean, it's like pure and simple. A lack of progress and a feeling of shame and regret at the end of it. Yeah. Uh, and I think... Oh, I, yeah. I think a big part of that reason is because, you know, I don't know, maybe this is me thinking, like, you know, I'm special because I'm a web designer, but well, you a, are lot of, Kevin. a lot of what makes a web designer good in people's eyes is how efficient they are and how fast they work. Mm -hmm. Because when you work in something that involves, like, code or programming, in most cases, all of that code is out there on the web, somewhere to be found if you know where to look. And so really what makes one person better than the other is how quickly they can put that code together or write it from scratch. And when you have a bad art day, that doesn't happen, and you become the antithesis of the fast, efficient coder. That's, that's actually... That's a really yeah. interesting point, and I think that that could be a huge conversation of itself. I, I know for other, uh, other media, mediums, other <laughs> areas of art, there's this huge debate between, you know, speed and efficiency versus really taking your time. Um, and I wonder, because it's not really something that I have thought too much about just because I'm not a web designer. Um, you know, how much of that, is there any room for uh, getting away from the efficiency? I mean, I know if you're working on deadlines, you're working for clients, it's, it's top priority. But Yeah, I mean, certainly there's an aesthetic aspect of my work like there is to yours but I don't have things in my work like um, quality of my line work or my, my shading or you know what I mean all that stuff that goes along with an art form that is really like done by hand mm -hmm. which I think all three of you that applies to all three of you um, when there's this interface between you and your art you know like the gestures I make with a mouse have very little relation to what appears on screen so, like, what, what defines the quality of my work becomes uh, a totally different thing, or at least the breakdown of what makes a good web designer becomes more skewed towards things like efficiency and how fast they are, uh, along with, you know, other things like the beauty of their interface and uh, the aesthetic qualities that kind of apply to art across the board. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, that efficiency thing is big for me, so when I don't have it, uh, that kind of defines a bad art day. Man, I'm glad I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, um, all right, so we, we've got a good overview of what the four of us see as a bad art day. Let's talk about how it looks, yeah. What, well, we're going to talk about what triggers one, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And this is, um, for me, the trigger, a lot of times, they, they always seem to come at the worst possible time, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that makes me wonder, is a bad art day really come at the worst possible time or you just notice them then? Mm. Because you could wake, you know, if you wake up at the beginning of a project or you wake up on a Saturday or something and you don't really feel like doing work, uh, you're, you're, you might be unmotivated just like you are on your bad art days. Mm -hmm. You don't get anything done and then you move on and life's fine. You know, is that like, a bad oh, it's art just day? a Saturday. Yeah, is that is that just a Saturday you didn't feel like doing art, or is that a bad art day? Like, I'm wondering, because when they appear closer to deadlines, for instance, if there's two days left for this website to launch, and one of them ends up getting eaten by a bad art day, the consequences of that bad art day are a lot worse than a lost Saturday. So I wonder, uh, with that realization, what triggers one versus the other? Mm -hmm. And they all... Uh, the ones that I remember that stick out in my mind are the ones that are close to deadlines. So as, as a web designer, we work in modules a lot. 
So if you think about, everyone's familiar with a web page. Every web page. Explain web... modules to the to the layman. Yeah. <laughs> and to me, like myself. The layman like and myself. To me. <laughs> so most web pages have like a navigation in a header. They might have a sidebar. They might have a content area. Let's talk about. We can use Facebook as an example. Mm -hmm. The little blue bar across across the top could be considered a module. Mm -hmm. uh, so we tend to work. I think everyone tends to work in, in mini microcycles within their projects. So if I'm coding that header module, I'm kind of in the zone and focused on getting that header module done. It's in those in-between states when I'm between one module and it's like I'm at 100% completion and then my bar resets and I'm back to zero on the next module. Oh, yeah. You know, and then it's like, I did yeah. all that work and I'm back to zero. <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not, that like depresses my me. Mind. Like, I feel bad for I'm like, oh. Oh, for my, my opinion, it's the same kind of feeling. Like, you get to a certain point in a painting, and like, yeah, this is, like, I don't know, you sketch out the, the underpainting and get all the uh, proportions correct in whatever you're doing or the composition right. You're like, yeah, this is going to be awesome. And then it's time to, I don't know, color block it in, and you're like, oh, no. Yeah, it's like the end, <laughs> the end of yeah. your rough draft. Yeah, and it's like, oh, the there's one of... more thing that I might mess yep. up <laughs> and then you know every step is like another thing that like oh god if I mess this up <laughs> I have to start over again or whatever yeah. yeah in a lot of ways that that hundred percent completion work of one thing becomes zero percent of the next yeah and it's not really fun for me until I'm at the, like the very end and I'm just adding the details I'm like this is great yay because <laughs> there's a lot less risk and time that it needs to yeah. I mean, that's interesting because for me, that's usually it starts off that way, and then I'll be finishing up the details, and then I'll be like, wait, everything underneath this is awful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've, I've, I'm trying to teach myself to not get to the point where I'm at details until right. I'm like... Yeah. So your structure it's is good. secure. Yeah. But it's so much fun to play with, like, the icing on the cake instead mm -hmm. of, yeah, yeah. you know, like, mm, yeah. So I've been, yeah, I've been <laughs> trying to yeah. break this down a lot and, you know, figure out what is the trigger. And I try to convince myself it's not just procrastination because a lot, I think a lot of people when they, you know, you think about that person in college that was, like, always at parties having a blast and they would manage to squeak their project in at the last second. But they were always having a happen. they were having a blast though. <laughs> it's my point. Like they were having fun. Yeah. And they put the thing off and then they got it done. But like when I am having a bad art day, it might it might look like procrastination because I'm not doing the work, but it is not enjoyable. Right. You know, you're you might be watching TV or you might be trying to occupy yourself otherwise, but that entire time your mind is locked on the project that's not getting done. Yes. And that guilt and regret and like uh, yeah, but I think it's a key distinction. Of yeah. yeah, it's a key distinction between not doing the work or not making progress and procrastinating. Um, so I'm trying okay. to figure out. Yeah, yeah, you and I just, you know, we we very recently had that exact conversation. That you know, there's this this misconception that if you are not actually, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. The busy putting person. the work in. Yeah, if you're not actually at the keyboard, you're not actually at the canvas, then what are you doing? You're not working. You're having free time. But as an artist, at least for me, and you know what I've had in my conversations with you, Kevin, and Kate as well, mm -hmm. that even though you're not actively working, that free time is still spent in that same mental place. It's mm -hmm. not white space in your brain. Right. Your brain is still going a mile a minute on wherever yeah. you just yeah. were your body is doing so, like yeah, whether you can be in a pool in Hawaii and my head is still going a mile a minute with work <laughs> yeah and so you can just as easily get burnt out by you know by having that quote unquote free time so because it's so difficult to just turn that off and Mike we talked about this concept of the, the busy person uh, right you know I can't tell you how many times I've had this exact conversation since I started my business you run into someone you haven't seen in a little while Ask, you tell them you started the business. Oh, how's it going? Oh, you know, things are busy. And they say, oh, that's a good problem though, right? And you're like, yeah, good and bad, you know. <laughs> and I word for, it's word for word that conversation over and over. I hate and that I, conversation. So that, yeah. you know, you're constantly telling people how busy you are, mm -hmm. which is true because you have a lot of projects going on. But when you have a bad art day and things don't get done, you start to feel like a liar. Yeah. You know, to all those yeah. people that you've told, yeah. you're, you're so busy, like, my girlfriend comes over and makes dinner after mm -hmm. I've had a bad art day, 
and oh, you just God. feel like, I, I, don't oh, deserve this. Yeah. I do not deserve this dinner you just made me. Yeah. I know I've told you how <laughs> I am, but... I have nothing to prove my worth today to the yeah. world. Mm. I don't or, you, or you told someone, like, I'm sorry, I've got to work today, and then you didn't do, you didn't do, do it. anything. And you blew them off for no reason. Yeah. So, Michelle, what triggers your bad art days? Do you know, like, have you oh, ever identified man. what, like, what sets you into that spiral? I don't know that I've figured that out yet. <laughs> what uh, what triggers? Do you the bad can you kind of backtrack and think what generally precedes them? Um, that's the trigger. Like for me, it's those breaks between modules where I have time to yeah. reflect on progress. Is it something like that? It is. It's it's uh. It's that yeah. It's it's when a painting painting gets to a certain point and I'm just not sure where to bring it up like right. you know I'm just I'm, I'm at like writer's block you know it's like yep. having writer's block that's exactly what I guess mm -hmm. that's the trigger I don't know but I would think writer's block is triggered by something but anyway um, <laughs> I, think uh, I think what a lot of us are getting at is it's it's those in-between progress moments yeah. When, because it's such of... a contrast between full on productivity to what's next. And if you're not ready for what's next, you freeze. I think it's fear, too. It's like, it's fear that, oh my god, this is going to be the painting that sucks. Like, yep. <laughs> you know, like, like I don't know how I did all of those other ones. Somehow, I, some, I magically made those. But yeah. this one is not going <laughs> to. This one's not going to work out. I know that's not, you know? And it's like this fear that it's just, this one can't happen. I don't know. Yeah. Does I it, definitely do yeah. the, the downtime, like, in between. I, I noticed that my bad art days are usually triggered by some sort of inactivity. Um, yeah. So if I get up and out of bed and drink my coffee and get to work, I'm in a great mood. I have the best day ever. If I get up and kind of like lounge around for too long or stay in bed for too long, I've just set the stage for the day. Um, also, you know, maybe I have a job bright and early and I go to work for a couple hours and then I've got a couple hours in the afternoon before I go back to work. If I don't keep myself busy, the maybe it's just zone. like you get danger zone. Like don't spend too much time <laughs> in your own head. It's like not a good neighborhood. And uh, it's just, it like, that kind of inactivity. If I can keep myself active and moving and I'm, like, engaged in something and creating and doing or whatever, um, I'm, I'm fine. But as soon as I, I have that kind of inactivity and, I don't know, my head just starts to go somewhere yeah. and I can't yeah. always bring it back. I'm the same way. I, I actually got a lot done this week. Um, I had a really good week, actually. Maybe that's why I'm having trouble figuring out my trigger because I had a really good week. Hmm. But um, What stage were you in? Of the project. The very final stages. Yeah. <laughs> All the icing. So, All the fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also I had a deadline, like, now. So um, that was motivation. But uh, you knew, normally I have all these other things I need to do during the day. Like, besides painting, you know, I, need, I, I usually wake up and I go to yoga. And then I come home and I eat breakfast and then I paint or whatever. Um, but that doesn't always work out. Like, this week I was like, nope, I'm waking up, I'm taking a shower, and I'm getting the paint on the canvas, that's mm. just, yeah. and that's, yeah, if I don't uh, go diving straight into it, I can sort of get lost in the day. And, yeah, it gets you yeah. off track, yeah. and your, your head wanders, and it just, you just don't, And it's it hard to, happen. it's hard to wake up every single day and dive right in, you know, sometimes right. you wake up and you're like, yeah, I just... you know, I feel like doing something else. We're, we're starting <laughs> to get into how to avoid these things, right? How do, mm -hmm. how do we combat them? Do we want to really dive into what our... I don't think any of us has the solution, but at least what are some tactics? Yeah. Um, well, you know, I'll get into that. You know, for me, t to be real, you know, as, as we were in the sort of pre-production of this episode, I'm thinking, well, what, what can I say? How do I combat? And I, I, I have been coming to terms with, I still struggle so significantly with this that I don't know that I've found something that consistently works. I mean... To be completely transparent, I've kind of been in the middle of a bad art month. You know, it's been weeks since I've really been able to put something out there that I can own and be proud of. And I think, uh, you know, as I was listening to you guys, I think something that that sounds like it's consistent for you guys and it's there for me is balance. Um, just either yeah. the balance or the lack of balance in every other area of life. 
that if that balance is not there, you know, and, and you are just completely honed in on one thing and you're obsessing over one thing, one, you're probably going to start seeing things in a way that you wouldn't otherwise because you start to lose perspective. It's like if you're in a relationship, it's very easy to give other people relationship advice, but when you're in a relationship, <laughs> you're so close to it that everything is like, oh my god, this is either the best thing ever or the worst thing ever, and no one understands. Yeah. <laughs> I'm the only one with this problem ever, right. and it's the yeah. worst problem in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for me, I guess one of the things that helps me the most is to try and you know get back some semblance of balance. I know for me, uh, probably now that I think of it, I haven't been to the gym consistently for a couple of weeks, and that's probably part of oh, it. Yeah. Or even right? just the endorphins you get from going exactly. to the gym to pull you out of a bad art day or keep you out of a bad art day, because that, that does something to your body. Like, the that's the sun. Oh, my God. Yes. If I could go out for a walk. See, I solved it for everybody. We can end the episode. <laughs> yeah. We're all going everybody to the gym. Everybody go to the gym. We all just <laughs> need to move to Florida. <laughs> well, that gets We're into having this. an artistic awareness meetup pity party at the gym. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, at the gym. It gets into this common approach that a lot of people recommend is to do something productive, mm. whether or not it's art, whether it's washing the dishes, taking a shower right when you get up, making coffee, whatever it is that... I, I think there's a lot of merit to doing something that makes your environment better than it was before. Yeah. Michelle, you actually to... said something about that mm -hmm. uh, when we had talked previously about you know when you just can't get anything done, to reevaluate and this spoke to me a lot, was just to reevaluate, like, what am I capable of getting done today? How about yeah. I just set myself three? If I just get three things done today, we'll just call that a success. Like, you know, you kind of reset your standard of what you want to accomplish. And I, I, I remember you, uh, like, one of your examples was, like, I'm going to get up and I'm going to, like, clean my brushes. Because that doesn't take brain power. You could just get up and clean your brushes. Something's been accomplished. It's not an entire waste of the day. Yeah. Um, which I thought was really great. It helps with the... It helps at... Um, Reducing the guilt, you know, yeah. that can sort of snowball into worse things. It just cascades. That's what yeah. gets me every so time. To is it try starts and off. Get that to not happen, mm -hmm. so that I don't have, you know, a bad month. I'll say, you know what? It's fine if I sit here and watch a movie or watch five movies today, <laughs> whatever I do, or sit on Reddit. But every time that I get up out of my chair, I have to do something. Like, I have to get something done, like, whether it's a load of laundry or dishes or clean brushes or whatever, I have to just do something. And then at the end of the day, I've done a few things, and I don't feel so guilty. Like, maybe I didn't get my painting done, but I got this other stuff done, you know. And then Sometimes it's a total cool. loss, yeah. I just, Sometimes came up with really... a metaphor. I just came up with a metaphor that I think, Kevin, you personally would be pretty proud of. All right. You know, just to find these little things to kind of... Reset. How bad of a day were you have if Kevin hates it? <laughs> I'll have the worst day. Kind of like being, uh, like at a seven course meal and then taking little breaks. You know, the little sherbet you take to sort of reset the palate. Nice. Yeah. Right. What is so right? the sherbet? The, uh, You're fired. The laundry. You're fired from artistic awareness. What's that? <laughs> so the sherbet is like the laundry. Like the it. laundry or like going to the gym or something because, the you know, the meat, the actual meal, what you're working on, that's the focus. That's where the attention is. Are you kidding? Sherbert sounds so much better. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. <laughs> but, you know, having these little things, these little things where you can actually shut off for just a minute and kind of just recharge, reset the, the programming, it gives you the ability to go back into the, you know, the second course, third course or whatever with, you know, a, a renewed perspective. I know, for me, I actually was terrified of that. I would be up late working on an illustration of some kind until, like, 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'd be like, okay, this is good. And I would wake up in the morning, and I would be terrified to go back to the computer and open it up because I know with fresh eyes, now that I've taken this little break, I hope this isn't awful. Yeah. But, <laughs> but that's what you this, need. I find the opposite a lot when it comes to code and, like, more logic driven processes than like creative is when you run into a brick wall programming a certain module I can't tell you how much it helps to just come back the next day I mean it's almost on repeat you'll sit down and have the solution within 15 minutes on something you spent five hours on the day before my husband uh, is making a video game and he does that all the time yeah. he, he just like has to put it down 
He's, he, he'll spend seven hours with one problem, like, oh my god, something's wrong with my code, and I don't know what, ah! And yeah, then... Tell us he, about the video game. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I can tell you a little, it's, um... It's made in Unity, and it's, okay. uh, It's, like, a sort of an exploration game where you're, like, you go to a planet, and you have to collect little, an like, animals, and doc like, put them in your spaceship as, like, you know, your car, like... As if you were making a zoo, kind of. Like. There's animals yeah. and spaceships? It sounds... Yeah, untold. and plants. Untold. Like, you have a document, like, you know, like, I found this kind of plant, I found this kind of animal, and then you kind of have to fight them sometimes, or they're like, don't take my baby! <laughs> <laughs> like, for your zoo! <laughs> but that, that whole idea of taking... <laughs> <laughs> Kevin's gonna Sorry. try to transition it. <laughs> yeah, that totally is. <laughs> Bring it back. I, I have a legit transition. Wait. Bring it back. I'm really time. excited to see what you do. <laughs> that whole idea of of taking breaks and coming back goes back to that need to finish modules in chunks. Like we have this need that if we're close to finishing something, at least I do. I'm not going to bed until that thing's done. That has kind of a negative effect because. The next day, you're starting from zero. Whereas, if you're at 95% and it's the end of the workday, end the workday and come back to it and finish in the morning, because then not only do you keep a regular life balance, but you you get that easy little finish, you know, the fun finish. Oh, um, yeah. Putting the details on it. Mm. Uh, and then starting the next thing and already kind of having the ball rolling. Oh, I think about good. going back to, you know, the Dave Lally episode, the gift that keeps on giving. It's like he, he had that one piece of advice that was to write down things you're going to do the next time you sit back down at your desk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. I'm going to use that. Like, not, like, we, like, kind of, I don't know what a good analogy is. <laughs> um, an inappropriate one is coming to mind, but, like... <laughs> um, Animals and farms in space. Go with that one. No, like... Uh, uh, not finish what the the module you're you're working on, mm -hmm. and and it might be hard, but leave the the very last part of that until your next session, so that you start with something you feel good about. Yeah, because I yeah. think um, you know it, it, the other thing Dave said was like regardless of the stress or the pressure or the deadline, like make time to do that. Take those. 30 seconds to write down what's next so that the second you sit down that next day, you know what's coming. Because I think it's that, that blank slate, that feeling of the unknown is a huge part of what triggers these things. I actually get nervous uh, about taking those breaks you guys were mentioning because I know that one of my biggest triggers, and so thus how I combat it is avoiding this trigger, is you know taking a break from something and having that lull. So that kind of like okay. that actually makes me kind of nervous. That's how I have to combat it: is to recognize I'm going to have downtime. How am I going to fill it? I try um, to. Oh, sorry. Go. go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, oh. Um. Sometimes I I redefine what balance even means. I'm like, you know, maybe balance is like a month on and a month off. Maybe it evens out in the end. I don't know. You know. That's mm. I've done that also. Like, you yeah. know what? Maybe maybe I feel unbalanced now, but like. Maybe I'm wrong. Like that doesn't. Who says this is balance or this isn't balance? Or maybe I just need a day. If I'm if I'm like knees deep in a bad art day, like I can try to combat it all I want. And sometimes you just end up in a bad art day, and like, what are you gonna do to get out of it? And yeah, sometimes it's just accepting that like maybe this is balance. Maybe this is my body telling me I need a day off. Maybe mm -hmm. you know I don't know. Maybe there is something I can do. I can get something done every time I get up. Maybe I can mm -hmm. call someone. Uh, that usually will help me if I can get someone in my support network, like of you know artistic friends, on the phone. Um, that will totally get me out of it. The problem is I'm usually too unmade, unmotivated to call, so uh, oh. I, don't, I don't actually do that. <laughs> I mean, Mike called me the other day, and I'm in the middle of like a super stressful deadline, and I'm like, you know, first reaction is I don't, I don't have time to talk to you. <laughs> like, like I gotta go. Nobody has time but, to talk to Mike. <laughs> I mean, I ended up talking for like an hour about this kind of stuff, and it's amazing the help that it does if if you do really make time for it. And sometimes it takes someone else taking that step because you're not going to do it yourself. But to branch off of that idea, I've been thinking, you know, we all kind of work for ourselves, mm -hmm. and I don't remember nice, having. Kevin. I don't remember having these kind of days. Mm. when I worked for, you know, a bigger company. 
And I, I wonder if part of it was the regular regiment that you know everyone leaves the office at five regardless of what's right. going on for the most part. Is that help it, or is it that I am more connected? Uh, I have more passion for the work that I'm doing now, and I want it to be so perfect that starts to trigger these things. But that's one thing we all have in common here. That mm -hmm. wondering is that the underlying thing that all of this control is up to us, and we don't have anyone else to help regulate it. And it that's took actually, Mike, it yeah, took Mike that's calling that's me. Actually, really insightful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a big part of it. Actually, sometimes I will um, go out and take classes that you know. Not, I don't necessarily. Well, no, it's always, you always need classes. I mean, you can never, like, reach the pinnacle of your art. There's always somewhere to go up. But I'll go and take classes just so that I'm in an environment with other people structure. working. Yeah, and I have structure. And I'm like, all right, those are the five hours that I'm going to be painting. And I go in there, and I don't have any of those bad art day feelings when mm -hmm. I'm in, a, when I'm in a, a, a studio with other artists. Yeah. You know, I, I go in there, and everyone else is putting their paints out. I'm like, oh, cool. You know, we're talking. I think that's a huge part of it. When I'm at home alone, trying to manage myself. Yeah, there's there's the positive um, deterrents that come from working with other people or for other people, like the ones mm -hmm. you just mentioned, just feeling good in a group. And then there's, I think, also the negative deterrents, like, okay, if I have a bad art day on my own, I'm my, I'm my own boss. Like I said, you can get away with that lie that you're that's busy, true. but if you're working for a real boss, there's no getting away with the fact that you didn't show up for work. Yeah, I think it's less about the structure for me and more about the responsibility. When I um, when I'm in charge of myself and managing myself, and my name is on everything I put out, and I like I am the face of what I do. Um, there's I think I think I get bogged down with that level of responsibility, and I take it really personally when I have a bad art day. Like it weighs on me extra because I'm like I'm the only one responsible for this. How could I let this happen? Whereas if I'm working for someone else, I don't have that feeling because I don't feel like I, I don't. I'm that can I, like what we were mentioning. You're part the of a whole, not the whole. Yeah, I'm not the whole, and I can separate mm -hmm. myself from what's going on. Uh, and it's I doesn't. I don't have to take it personally then, yeah. but I take it personally when I, it's I, mm -hmm. I have all of that responsibility on my own shoulders. You know, I, I think that this this was a perfect segue because I was actually I, I've been thinking about structure and how how hugely important structure is. Um, that here's an example. I, I think uh, Michelle, you were talking about taking classes. For me, um, when I was about, I think my senior year of high school, maybe I'd always wanted a guitar. Um, so as a gift, like as my graduation present, I think I got a guitar, and it was essentially it was just sitting around. I went to college, I brought it with me, and maybe I took it out once or twice, but nothing ever happened because I was leaving things up. You know, I I was doing things my way you know there was no structure uh, it was just it was all on me so I, I remember thinking to myself uh, it was my senior year of college and I had actually I had completed all my my required courses and I had these electives open and I remember thinking to myself uh, you know I want to take a guitar class because I know that I want to play a guitar but what this does is by you know registering into this class it forces me into that structure so that I, I have to fit into that framework and you know I, I have to there's no way for me to not do this because I want to play guitar but if left to my own devices I'm gonna find a million other things to do mm -hmm. so after college you know recently within the past year or two I I've decided I really need to take that on for myself because there there aren't always gonna be classes or things like that but what it is is structure now so my entire my entire is life structure? is now on Google calendars or is that reprioritizing, like creating? I, no, I don't think so at all. Reprioritizing. Uh, I mean, you could bring it that way, but for me, I, it's it's structure. Have it's, you been able to do it, Mike? Yeah, I have, and so I guess how, that's, what is it now that forces you to sit down that you didn't do before? So I, I actually I have my entire life. I can look at it on Google calendars, even the free time, and it sounds like maybe it's a little bit too much. Maybe it's micromanaging, but that way. You know, there's no sitting around and feeling like maybe I should be doing this, maybe I should be doing that. And sometimes I do do that. Like on weekends, maybe I'll leave some of that open stuff. Um, but I'm learning I can't really do that anymore because I end up just sitting around on my weekends feeling guilty like I should be doing something. So if I put that, whatever that structure, that I, you know, whatever that is, if I put that in existence, if I put that on my calendar, I know 
what I'm going to be doing, when I'm going to be doing it, and I can focus mm -hmm. all of my energy on that given task. So you mean like when you, instead of just allowing your free time to be the in-between of what's on your calendar, you mean mm -hmm. like blocking in your free time so you can focus on, like that is that is free time. Like, yeah. Is that, okay. That is good, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, you, Mike, you and Caitlin, I think since we've been working on this together, you guys always have like the calendar thing going on. Mm -hmm. And I picked it up over the last week or so, and it really started getting Finally. Things. Finally. <laughs> welcome to the club. Congratulations. You're welcome, Google. You're we welcome, can be Google done. calendars. I've been following the system called Getting Things Done. Give us money, Google. Please give us money. <laughs> uh, but this system called Getting Things Done, it's like a whole it's a whole mindset, and there's a book on it. But one, the first step is to get everything out of your head into yeah. something, whether it's a task manager or a calendar. That's a huge one. I just gave a presentation on time management and organization, and that's one of the biggest things is, like, create white space in your brain. Get it mm -hmm. out of your head because if it's if you don't get it out of your head, it's going to bounce around in there, and you're going to be terrified. You're going to forget it. Just yeah. But since I've, started, yeah. since I've started doing that, what I've found is I, I keep it on um, this app called OmniFocus that I put all this stuff into, and it just kind of sits on my desk. And I found myself several times just in the last week finding myself in those in-between zones where whatever, Facebook pops up or I start answering a random email and I look back at the task and I'm like, okay, that's what's next. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing what that, if that's not out of your head, the current thing is always going to supersede it, whether it's that email, the Facebook, the whatever that's distracting you. If there's not someone else, like Mike was the person who called me that interrupted my day and forced me to have a conversation I needed to have. You don't always have that outside person, so create an outside thing, whether it's a Ooh. list or a task manager or whatever it might be that will snap you out of those moments. And especially as artists, uh, I think I mentioned in another episode, someone, uh, one of those funny things you put on, on Facebook, it's like a quote or whatever, that being an artist is like having a web browser with a million tabs open all the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? Especially for people like us where there's so much going on. Uh, whether, you, even if you're a business person, but specifically as an artist, there are things going on a mile a minute all the time that if you keep it, you know, if you rely on your brain, oh my God, what a nightmare. So <laughs> by just taking these things out, like whenever I hear something, someone gives me like a, a link to a cool website, an article or whatever, I immediately, uh, like I'll, I'll send myself an email or I'll put it on my calendar or something like that. So one, my hard drive is already full anyway. Yeah. So, you know, just put it there. Put it in existence. I don't need to be responsible for that just with my crazy head. It's there, and it's it's not something I need to stress about anymore. Yeah. I find that the, going back to how this started with the uh, writing everything down, I think what's really important to remember is what you said to write down uh, or make time for free time. Because yep. I do, you know, I'll write everything down that I need to do during the day, um, but without, I realize that, like, putting in those blocks of free time. It creates it, validity to it. Yeah, right? it does. Like, yeah. it's allowed yourself to, no, no, this is, I, I have spaced this out as free time so I can be 100% dedicated here to unwinding and not to all the other things in the back of my head. That I handle in the next block. It starts in two and a half yeah, hours. Yeah, so because I'm off getting... The block. Your to-do list can be a little bit daunting. You're like, oh my god, I got to do all these things. Writing in those little free time blocks, you're like, yeah, I can get that done. Like, you know, in the first half of the day, and then I can. Oh, you're yeah. making motions. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what it ultimately comes down to is, if we have that the structure or the putting things down in paper, whatever it might be, it's getting us back to a balanced state. Mm. So. It, I think there's, you know, everyone has a different answer for it. Different things are going to work for different people. Totally. I think what we what we established today is one bad art days suck. They <laughs> two, two, there are specific. Don't have them. No. I'm I don't recommend it. <laughs> there are specific triggers for these things, and the more you can look inward and and analyze what's causing them, the quicker you can get to the solutions to combat them. Yeah. So with that said. We're going to try something a little bit new uh, this episode because this is kind of the first time we have a digital and traditional art representative <laughs> going so head to head. We have a schmancy, oh, fancy schmancy Q&A segment because we have tons of questions for our lady here. Um, so we're going to do a little Q&A. And this is actually a great opportunity. As we mentioned, uh, I think 
at the beginning of the show, maybe before we officially went live, um, if you guys are watching via YouTube, uh, you should be able to see like a little uh, overlay, a little, I think, yellow link that says, you know, join the conversation by joining Q&A or whatever. So as we're doing our Q&A with Michelle, any questions that you guys have, either for her or for us, go ahead, plug those questions in, and uh, you know, if it's up there, we'd be happy to read those if there's time. Hmm. Awesome. All right. So first question for you, Michelle. How have your experiences as a gallery manager affected your work as an artist or like vice versa? Um, I expected it to affect my art a lot more, and I'm surprised that it hasn't um, hasn't affected. I mean, you know, my creative uh, processes or uh, my ideas. You know, they're all still kind of the same. I'm on. I'm kind of on the same track there. But it has totally changed the way I think about um, the business side of being an artist. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Did you feel like you got a, a lot that you can take away and apply to your own? Yes, you know, I mean personal. Networking, yeah. yeah, the the way, how to network, who to network with, um, uh, how to wear how fancy to, cocktail dresses and pretend you know what you're talking <laughs> yeah. about in rooms full of people who are way more qualified than you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really good. Um, uh, so bullshitting. Um, no. um, in terms of the actual art, you don't feel like um, you know working in the gallery and looking at art done by other people, do you find yourself borrowing techniques? Or? Well, I actually worked in a gallery and, uh, that mostly represented abstract work, and I don't really do that uh, in my... Per I mean, I will dabble, but that's not really uh, my focus. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it really didn't inspire... It, it, I would see a painting, and all oh, those colors together look really cool, or that composition is mm -hmm. really cool. But that's pretty normal for me daily. I mean, I do that all the time anyway when I go out and look at art and stuff. So, you know, um, yeah, I would say the business side of being an artist, though, that was it was really enlightening. Okay. Yeah. Right. Uh, and I actually, I have a question for you. Okay. So, uh, you know, if there's an artist who has never been shown in a gallery before, what would you say is the best way to get your uh, you get your foot in the door? I think that you mentioned it. We started to, to jump into it in the beginning. But what would you say for, for yeah. a movie? Um, it's multifaceted and, and, you know, complicated. I would say, first and foremost, have, you know, a, a, um, cohesive a really portfolio. strong, cohesive portfolio. You mm -hmm. know, um, I was, a lot of uh, submissions I would get were websites where they'd have some portraits over here, some landscapes over here, some abstracts, some digital, some photography. And it's like, uh, we can't really, what are we, we can't really represent you. We need to have, you need to have like sort of a, I don't want to say you have to have a thing, hmm. but it needs to be. But look at all of these things I can do. Yeah, I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, because you want to be marketable. That's what the gallery's job is to do, is to, to market you and, you know, so, so that, that needs to be there. Um, In terms of the first impression then. First impression. What do, you, do you? I mean, just in terms of how to make it, a lot of people in other types of business will say, "Call them, don't email them." You know, get your voice. But this is a, such a visual. Honestly, business. do you prefer like an email with a link to a portfolio? What's the best thing? Yeah, you know what? Here's the best thing you can do: go to the uh, gallery's website and check out what information they have for submissions and follow those directions yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it is so annoying when someone will put in a submission and it's like they never ever checked out our website, they have no idea what kind of art we have, like represent, they yeah. didn't follow the directions for, for, you know, and we had pretty clear directions for uh, what's, what you do to submit work. Um, so, so do, do your homework. So, yeah, do your homework. Make sure you follow those directions. Um, you know, if it says to email, don't call. If it says to call, call, you know. Because mm -hmm. um, there's a reason that they have rules. It's to make things more efficient for them and, you know. All right. Um, and then also I would say networking is huge. Yeah. That's the one thing. I mean, you could submit things all day and, you know, you might get a show or a gallery here or there, but... Um, networking is the thing that's going to work out the best for you. So, I mean, and not ne and network with other artists because a lot of times galleries will trust 
other artists recommendations more than anyone because an artist is, if they're recommending another artist that's competition to them so they must believe in that other artist so much that they they want that competition they want to be in a gallery with that other artist you know what I mean where the value outweighs the competition like they must yeah. be so credible and valuable that I'm willing to tell you about them even though they're direct competition kind of deal kind of or, or that like that, that artist that you trust and you've sold their work um, they think that this other artist that they know would kind of complement their career as well you know like being in a gallery with that artist would be good for me um, and that that's meaningful or or you know sometimes other galleries that we've got we had an artist that uh, we got from another gallery that was closing and um, you know I'm gonna trust another gallery a lot more than uh, you know a submission right um, so networking is is big so I I have a question here that I have been looking forward to because and I have a ton invested in this one as well <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> Well, this idea of traditional versus digital is really part of the thing that sparked the program, right, Mike? I mm -hmm. mean, it's part, it's part of what created a lot of the self-doubt issues um, because there is this perception that we are imposters in this art world, that people have been painting for thousands of years, and yet we've only been using computers to create art for a few decades, if that. So, like, does digital art, in your opinion, have a place in the gallery world, which, in my opinion, is, like, that's the thing in my head that is the opposite of, that is, like, the furthest away from digital art. It's, like, fine art, this, this place is protected, and it's really hard to get into kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, the art world is really hard to get into. That's true for any kind of art, <laughs> not just digital. That's just yeah. true all, all the way around. Um, but digital work is becoming more and more and more prevalent, definitely. I mean, uh, I've gone to shows and galleries with, I mean, actually some of my favorite things I've seen in the past few years have been digital. Um, it was my so, work. <laughs> <laughs> so whether it's like, uh, you know, a movie or, or um, a sort of like a holographic kind of thing, <laughs> I don't even yeah. know what it was. You know, well, the answer you gave earlier on Facebook kind of referenced, you know, if it sells, it'll it'll be in there. For yeah, sure. like, so, like anything else, it's a business. But my question is, does the digital nature of it hurt that ability to sell because a lot of the reason why people purchase fine art in the first place is because it's a one of a kind. Mm. Like a digital, well, digital art piece by its nature can be replicated. That's exactly part of the digital definition. It can. Um No, you know, the market is dictated by the people who have the money, um, and those people will kind of impulsively buy things they just like. Right. So if they just like it, if they just really like that projection on the wall, they'll they'll get it. They'll buy it. And isn't part of what makes people like it is that no one else can have it. I don't know if that's ever impacted my purchasing purchasing decisions before. You know, no, not necessarily. That is definitely a thing. You know, the, the fact that oh, when you have something that is rare, I mean, that's why, one, well, that's why diamonds are so valuable. It's because they're so rare. And um, because they're a girl's best friend? Is that what it was saying? <laughs> they're also yeah. my best friend. But, uh, you know, that, that, is, that is a really important thing. That's something that I butted up against uh, a lot as a digital painter is that, it's it's hard to go the fine art, the traditional art route, just because there isn't that original. Because if there is the original, you know, there it's it's like a prized possession, you know. Uh, and then the other side yeah. that I was thinking, you know, because there's always going to be, um, it's a progress issue. There there's always going to be, you know, the the separation between high art and low art, and what those two things mean. It, it's always, always progressing and always, you know, the definitions. I remember, you know, Kev, when you and I were taking art history at school, um, you know, high art was the traditional paintings, you know, the classical stuff where low art was more like uh, collage and, and comic book type well, stuff. That's not necessarily true anymore, I would say. Yeah, I mean, oh, it's constantly, it's yeah, constantly, it's constantly uh, changing. And, and the art world is really embracing digital work. I mean, digital paintings maybe are a certain niche that's a little bit harder to figure out. But For now. Uh, yeah, for now. <laughs> I mean, digital work is really, I mean, photography can be replicated, and that's right. successful. 
So I don't see why uh, digital. I hadn't thought about that. You're right. Yeah, yeah photography you know, is, is in the same kind of realm. That's um, actually it, really interesting. That, so that you have. Be, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah. So you have you know numbered prints that you would make, uh, and and also in art, the provenance is really important. Um, so that's you know past owners. So mm. as long as someone keeps the receipt and like yes, I purchased this original. Um, from the gallery, from the artist, whatever, uh, it kind of solves that problem of like, hmm. you know. But uh, along those lines of, you know, photography is kind of walking that line and, and even digital photography is, I think, closer to that fine art status than stuff like web design is considered. I think a lot of it has to do with the person understanding how much what goes into creating that art. For example, someone could show you a digital painting that looks entirely traditional, mm -hmm. but the second you know it's digital. I think that those... changes how much someone's willing to pay for it, how much they respect it. I think the, yeah. those uh, old ideas are kind of dissolving. Yeah. And people are just going to buy what they like, you know, bottom line. So, like, all that other stuff matters, like the work that puts in... But they're going to buy what they like to look at. <laughs> I have one final question for you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite body painter? Would you have? I know so many. <laughs> Definitely Kate There's, St. Angelo. Good, good. There's only <laughs> one right answer. I'm, I mean, I've personally been great painted by her, her so. <laughs> you have been. Yeah. Good story. I did once upon a time paint Michelle. She was delightful. <laughs> all right. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think that's all we've got for this episode. Um, you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash artistic awareness. Uh, and you can follow us on Twitter, which I highly suggest. Um, at Art Podcast is our Twitter, hand Twitter handle. La, la, la. Nice. Um, and you can watch out for an announcement of our next episode and details on how you can participate. Mike, you want to wrap it up? Absolutely. So thank you, Michelle. It's been a pleasure getting to know you. Um, you know, I, I always love being able to have these types of debates between digital and traditional. I know Kevin does too. Yes. Um, so it's it's really I, I love those type of opportunities, and it's mm -hmm. it's really cool to be able to get that perspective some from we someone who never have the traditional perspective. Exactly. Yeah. So we're we're gonna we're gonna be taking you guys over. So in the meantime, <laughs> here's, <laughs> here's your we opportunity. We can all live together in harmony. Yeah. Get ready for websites in all of your galleries. <laughs> But yeah, it's, this has been a lot of fun, and uh, you know, thanks again to the community for tuning in. Uh, you know, we again, we really wouldn't be able to do this without you guys, and uh, we look forward to keep bringing new content. We've got a lot of really great guests lined up for you in the future, so uh, stay tuned. So, on behalf of Kevin and Caitlin, Michelle, and myself, thank you guys, and we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.